Hello, I need to switch this to gallery view. How are you doing? Hello. 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 Hello.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. We're into March. March the third, the third Sunday of Lent. And I welcome you all in the name of God as we continue our journey through Lent. And by God's grace, I hope that it's a journey of spiritual growth for you. Uh, so let's. Uh, Begin then with the 
the litany. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to read Exodus 20, 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath me, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of their parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Thirteen, you shall not murder. Fourteen, you shall not commit adultery. Fifteen, you shall not steal. Sixteen, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And seventeen, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall covet your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female, slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the world of the Lord. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuits to the ends of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, re reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are, are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect one's own faults? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent, and do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. First Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are, who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord.
Christ according to John. Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I want to begin today with the psalm, Psalm 19. <clears throat> psalm 19 is about how God speaks through nature. <clears throat> begins, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork.
the heavens proclaim the glory of God <clears throat> and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. A lot of ink has been written over the years declaring how the existence of God can be proven by looking at nature. We see nature <clears throat> And by that I mean the world that surrounds us. We see the beauty of nature. We see the complexity of nature. And that is meant to speak to us. To speak to us about a creator. Because the way we think as, as human beings, how we think is very, in very concrete terms. So, I show you this bottle, and one of the first questions out of your mind is, who made that? Or I show you anything in this church, who made that? Who made those pews? You look at nature and a question that bubbles up within us is who made this? Where did it come from? <clears throat> Even yourself, look in the mirror and you say, who made, who made that? And we know it's not as simple as saying my father or my mother. And the answer that Psalm, one, the Psalm 19 gives us is that God is the creator. And the implication being, if you follow it all back to a point where God or someone, the Bible tells us that it was God who created it all. And what the writer of Psalm 19 is saying is that this evidence of creation that is before us speaks. It speaks to us about God. Day by day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is heard. <clears throat> I think it might be good to put a yet before the word there. There is no speech, nor are there words, yet their voice is heard. In other words, nature doesn't speak using words. <clears throat> the trees don't speak to us in words, yet they speak with a language that's even stronger than words. <clears throat> And it says, their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. So the voice of nature, not using words, speaks volumes to us, speaks to the very ends of the earth. That all of this beauty, that all of this nature had a creator or should I say, has a creator, because creation is an ongoing process. It's not by any means static. 
the way that this model is. The creation is a dynamic process going on and on, and it speaks through all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. Then the, the writer describes the creation of the sun. And then in verse 7, goes off on a little different tangent, if you like, and begins to speak about the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord, and then the decrees of the Lord, and the precepts of the Lord, and the commandment of the Lord. That all of these things are somehow communicated to us through the creation, through God's creation. That somehow in creation, God teaches us about who God is and how God operates and how we are expected to operate within the confines of nature within the confines of the creation of God. So he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And the decrees of the Lord, these words are all interchangeable, law, decrees, precepts, uh, fear of the Lord, commandments of the Lord. The decrees of the Lord are making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So then these directions, these words of the Lord which are communicated to us through, through the creation. This is God speaking through the creation. Through creation, God has established certain laws. In theological terms, that is often called a natural law. The law that's evident in creation. that we would live according to what creation is teaching us about God, what creation is teaching us about who we are and our function and our role within creation. Jesus goes to great lengths if you look at the gospel stories and the parables that Jesus uses, he refers over and over again to creation, to create illustrations, to create metaphors for the message that he is trying to communicate to us. See the birds of the air, neither do they sow or spin, and yet God takes care of them. He's creating an image there of creation trusting in God. And the message that's meant to come across to us is we as God's creation need to trust in God. The images that Jesus uses in the New Testament is that the, the animals and creation, by being that which they were created to be, glorify God. So, your dog that you have at home, 
praises and glorifies God by being a dog. When you're a cat, the same thing. Now we, on the other hand, we have an ability, I guess, that animals and creation in general does not have, at least not in any way that we are aware. And just because we're not aware of it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We say that we are, we are conscious human beings. We are conscious. Is nature conscious? Does nature possess a consciousness? The trees, the ocean, the skies, the animals, do they, do they possess a consciousness? Maybe they do. Maybe it's a consciousness that we're not in tune with. We elevate ourselves because of our consciousness. And one of the things about our consciousness, as much as we love it, as much as we glory in it, one of the abilities that we therefore have because of our consciousness is the ability to act in ways that are contrary to the will of God. So as we look at nature, we look at the animals and we say, oh, the dog is giving glory to God by being a dog. Oh, I want to give glory to God by being a human being, by being a real human being. But by virtue of that consciousness, it's complicated now. Because now I have, through that consciousness, an ability to act in ways that are not in line, are not in tune with. I'm out of tune with the Creator. Because I'm choosing a different path. Usually I'm choosing me. There's a way in, in which we are required, I believe, so that we are in tune with the natural law that God gives us through creation. there's a part of us we need to be able to surrender to do that. And if we're to listen to Paul today, the part that we are being asked to sacrifice is what we call the wisdom of the wise. This text from 1 Corinthians is challenging in the light of what we read in Psalm 19 about creation and the wisdom and the will of God that's expressed through that creation. Paul says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For he says, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness 
of the proclamation to save those who believe. The proclamation he's talking about is the cross. He says, Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom. So here he's referring to two different psychologies, if you will, the Greek and the Hebrew. The Hebrew wants to see signs. The Greek, a more intellectual approach. The Greek wants wisdom. After all, that's where all the great philosophers came from. But what Paul is saying, we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, because the Jews, the Hebrew, cannot see the symbolism, cannot see the sign of value. So a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. The cross, intellectually, makes no sense. Philosophically, makes no sense in terms of the Jewish, of, of the Greek philosophies of the day. Now, trying, if I will, to connect this to the nature that we are talking about. In my discussion of nature with the help of Psalm 19, I highlighted the beauty of nature, the creativity of nature, the complexity of nature. But there's another side to nature even, and that's the painful side. Those are the natural tragedies that occur in nature. The cycles of nature, even in the animal world, which seem so cruel at times. In what way do those events, in what way does that part of nature speak to us about God? And that's a tough question. It's a very challenging question. And the answer to that question is, according to St. Paul, in the cross of Christ. We would imagine, I think, in the best of all po possible worlds, that the creator of the universe, in an effort to bring us all to an understanding of God's glory and love, who sends his son among us to be one of us, to show us in his life the love of God. We would expect a happy ending, wouldn't we? We would, we, we would expect a happy ending to that. It's, it's such a beautiful notion that the God of all the universe Come and be a part of us. And yet it all ends seemingly in tragedy. But it speaks, I think, to laws of God that are part of nature everywhere, that there is a dying and a rising, that there is a cycle 
of death and resurrection that is part of it all and there's no way to operate without being able to embrace that and to make it part of our understanding of the greatness and the love of God. And that's why Paul seems to go on here about the cross, because truthfully, even the disciples, <laughs> the disciples themselves going through this process made no, couldn't understand it. Couldn't understand it at all. There was no rejoicing on the part of the disciples on Calvary when Jesus was being crucified. They were hidden, they were, they were running for their lives and continued to run for their lives and hide. Even after the resurrection, they still hid. It was only after the coming of the Holy Spirit that they became emboldened, that they truly understood. Because And, and John in the gospel makes that point in the discussion about the temple. When Jesus says, you see this temple? Tear it down and in three days I will build it up. But then John, by way of explanation, adds, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, the, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. It was only later much later that they understood what Jesus was saying. I mean, all of this must have seemed so confusing, so crazy to them at the time, but it was only later. And it was only later after the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit that they were able to understand, oh, I remember now, that's what he meant. And we, we, when we see that, we have to have a certain humility and a willingness when we see even difficult and painful things evolving in our lives. And when we reflect upon it in the light of the gospel, when we reflect upon those difficult situations in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there can always be that moment when we say, oh, now I know, now I understand. So that's all I'm asking today for you and me, for me, that in, in, a, in a real way that I can connect my life that I can connect the things that are going on in my life, that I connect my story to a greater, bigger story. And be healed, be restored, renewed. Dear Lord, in our lives, there are so many difficulties that come our way. And Lord, I ask this morning that instead of being overwhelmed by them, that through your spirit, you would show me how my pains and aches and disappointments and grief can be connected 
to the story of Jesus Christ, that I may understand your voice speaking in creation, that I may understand your voice speaking in my own life to embrace, to hold fast, and to be encouraged by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand now with me and let's pray in faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, hear our prayers. You need to unmute, Catherine. My apologies. Can you hear me okay? Hello, can you hear me? We hear you. Okay. Okay. I'll start. I apologize. I'll start over. We pray for the whole church, all leaders and ministers, and all the holy people of God, for our presiding bishop, the right Reverend Michael Curry, our bishop, Sally French, for all bishops and other ministers. In the worldwide Anglican communion, we pray for the church of the province of Uganda. In the Diocese of New Jersey, we pray for the Ministry of the Communication staff. Wash us through and through. In the St. James Church Calendar of Prayer, we pray for our church wardens, Marilyn Cody and Kathy Braun. We also rejoice also with those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. May your blessing be upon them. We pray for our nation, for all nations of the earth, and for all who govern and judge, especially President Biden, Governor Murphy, Mayor Tallarico, that they may serve justice and honor the dignity of every person. Purge us from our sin. We pray for the safety and security of people suffering in the war torn regions of our world, Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and Sudan, that they may know not only peace on earth, but your true and lasting peace. Love and truth will meet justice and peace will kiss. 
We pray for all who hunger and thirst, for those who cry out for justice, those who live under the threat of terror, and those without a place to lay their head. Make them hear of joy and gladness. We pray for those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are lonely, especially Rose Nixon, Jacqueline Flynn, Tasman Shakir, Father John Tomoso, Maria McDonough, Jerry Keelan, Heather Lane, Marsha Cookie Egan, William Grimmer, Kathy Braun, Ruth Eisen, Bobby Torres, Kevin Bates, Barb Harrison, Greg Fennell, Corinne Cromwell, Lou Cook, Randy Bates, the Reverend William Balmer, Marge Kienbaum, Barbara Lee, Frederick Herdeen, and those known to us who we name out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Give them the joy of your saving help again. In this season of Lent, we pray for those who prepare for baptism, and we pray that we all will be given the grace to repent and grow closer to you, O God. Create in us clean hearts, O God. We pray for those who have died and have entered into the land of eternal light and your abiding peace, especially Brenda Bolden, Phyllis Gilmartin, John Lacey, Anna Rupert, Alfred Bellavacqua. Are there others? Cast them not away from your presence. Merci oh, oh Lord, mercifully hear our prayer and stretch forth the right hand of your majesty to defend us from all harm through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace, y'all. Peace, Peace, everybody. Let us. All right. Have a seat for just a moment. I want to run by some items. Just to invite you to continue to attend our Lenten soup study, supper, prayer on Wednesday nights during Lent. We're studying uh, Bishop Michael Curry's book, um, Love is the Way. Um, we share soup, and then we end the evening by praying the night prayer of the Episcopal Church, which is called Compline. Uh, I invite you to sign on or to come in person. We have good, good discussion. We've been having very, very good discussion. I must say, um, please continue to support St. Bridget's Pantry. We've changed the items that we're looking for. Uh, we're looking now for peanut butter, jelly, crackers, uh, bread, any, anything in that arena. 
And then there's, a, I put a copy of an email or an abbreviated copy of an email we received from uh, Bishop Sally, which is important for the diocese in the sense that it seems that there are some problems with finances in the diocese, things that have not been maintained, appropriate financial and administrative controls have been lacking. Bishop Sally is trying to fix that. And that's about it. Uh, any, anything else I should be talking about? I do want to remind you to come and join us for coffee afterwards. My friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given, and human hands have made, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this wine to offer, which is the vine and the work of human hands, will become for us the cup of salvation. All things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. <laughs> it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace we are able to triumph over every evil, and to live no longer for ourselves alone. For him who died for us and rose again. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs>
We're going to be among us, Jesus loves us. We brought bread with outcasts and sinners, heal the sick, proclaim good news to the poor. He yearned to draw the whole world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. <clears throat> and then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. And the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends, and he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at this table for God and all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves, a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit over these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth. Make us your new creation, the body of Christ given to the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with Mary and Joseph, James and all your saints, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will, will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For in the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We all share in the bread. Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
In Thanksgiving now we pray, Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us the spiritual food, the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us of these holy mysteries, that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. Nourish our faith, increase our hope, and strengthen our love. Jesus, we pray, to hunger for him who is the true and living bread, and enable us to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do. Love and serve you to be faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his, account, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Thank <laughs> you. 